Drug developers, investors, researchers, and corporate executives wrestle weekly to understand what is happening in commercial development of NASH medications. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, and forecasting and pricing guru Roger Green as they discuss the issues affecting the evolving NASH market from their own unique perspectives on the Surfing the NASH Tsunami podcast. For everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, surfs up. Season 2 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami starts now with today's episode, How Will COVID-19 Affect the Fatty Liver Community in 2021? Hi, this is Roger Green. Everybody, welcome back from vacation. I hope you had some time to relax, refresh, recharge, what I've described as the three R's of vacation. I know I did. We... Also know that some of you did that while downloading an awful lot of podcast episodes. As of 2.30 Eastern Time on Monday, when we're taping this, there were a total of 526 downloads for the two year-end episodes, between the full episodes and the sub-episodes. And people went back into the old stuff and downloaded at least another 125 episodes from that. So in the relaxing, refreshing, and recharging, we're hoping we scored high on recharging Decent on relaxing, and if it's what refreshing, and if it's what you do to relax, I'm not sure how much I want to know about the rest of your life, but that's great. And thanks for uh, thanks for thanks for uh, joining, and thanks for downloading. To start 2021, we have Stephen and Louise, of course, and and also our good friend Manal Abdel Malik, who has stepped in kind of at the last minute to join us. And we're delighted that you're here, Manal. Thanks. Uh, just to open up, why don't each of us tell the audience one thing? during your downtime that you found particularly relaxing, refreshing, or recharging? Brave one, go first. Oh, I'll be the brave one. Um, We're brave on this side of the pond. Um, I suppose for me, it was multiple walks across Exmoor and getting the exercise we were allowed out and um, getting at least one day where we could see the family, but um, slightly a second one. 37 years in healthcare today. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a positive or a negative, but um, it seems like it only seems like yesterday I started as a real baby. <laughs> you must have been a baby. I was. <laughs> Seven year old nurses, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I enjoy tranquil walks with my children. Uh, A less hectic holiday season, which was filled more with a little bit more rest and relaxation than usual. And uh, the transitioning of my two children, who are now 12 and 14, from little girl and little boy rooms to big girl and big boy rooms, cleaning out closets and asking them literally, all these clothes have never been worn. They still have tags on them. Why haven't you worn them? Only to have them look at me and say, we haven't gone anywhere. So uh, it was uh, it was an eventful holiday and one for which we Zoom met with grandparents over uh, Christmas morning. Different, um, but I do look forward to a new year. Yeah, both those are terrific. I, I did something I've never done before. We actually uh, rented an RV and drove home to visit my in-laws and my parents, which we have done that every year, but this year we did it in an RV, which I thought was was interesting. It turned out uh, to be quite an adventure, but uh, one that that I would gladly do again. It was a lot of fun, a lot of memories built with uh, with my two children. I have a an eighteen year old and a twenty year old, and uh, I would say also I, I got my vaccine, my Moderna vaccine yesterday, so. You know, despite a sore arm, I'm asymptomatic and plugging ahead and and hopeful to get the second one here in 28 days or so and, and you know, be able to travel a little bit more freely. Fantastic. Not bad at all. So um, because we couldn't see any family um, during the week because they all live far enough away and in airports we didn't want to go through during Christmas holiday. We went back to Cape May, where we actually broadcast from in August, found um, a motel that had individual room heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, and managed to socially distance um, at the beach. 
course, it was too cold to go in the water. That would have been a problem. But um, just the change of scenery was, was fantastic. And uh, we were married there. We kind of decided to be a couple there years and years ago. And this is the first time since then we've been back and had no friends, no family, no nothing, just the two of us. That was So that was great. With all that good happiness behind us, let's dive into something maybe a little bit less happy, or certainly more complicated. Uh, so as we are trying to decide where to start the year, all you have to do is look at the newspaper stories or the television stories or pick the medium of your choice for the last couple of weeks, and, and everything kind of swirls around COVID-19. Um, I think Stephen had some experiences with that on vacation. He might, he might talk about briefly, Louise was talking about what's going on in the UK. I think we're all experiencing it. But if you think about it, at the same time, we have stories about the vaccine. We have stories about the so-called British variant that spreads a lot uh, more readily than, than the original did. We've got uh, continued anti-science sentiment um, in both, the, at least the US and the UK, uh, two countries that I can, we can talk about today. And we've got some issues that happen at the intersection of all three of those. So that's going to affect everybody. And it may well affect the fatty liver community in ways that aren't self-evident. So we'd like to spend some time with it today. First thing, each of us is going to pick one particular issue or news item from the past couple of weeks that strikes her or him as being important with some specific implications in fatty liver. And then after each of us has done that, we're all going to chat about what do all those things mean for, for clinical trials, for patient treatment, and for our vision of what the new normal might be like if there's ever going to be a normal again. And then finally, in the end, we'll talk about, so what would we do or suggest that other people do as a result? And that should be a pretty full program and a pretty interesting one. So let's go back to the first item. Um, Brave one, go first. Uh, pick a news item from the last couple of weeks. And maybe, uh, Stephen, you can tell us a little bit about what you saw in Jackson um, during the holidays to the side of that. And uh, let, let's put on the table things that have been going on that we think are important. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. So what I was alluding to uh, when we were speaking before the start of the podcast was in my trip home to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, I was able to visit with my little brother, who is an emergency medicine physician on staff at a very large hospital in downtown Jackson Baptist, the Baptist hospital system. And he was lamenting how literally in the past two months, uh, every day has gotten harder and harder. Uh, more and more people come in. He goes, he basically was alluding to the fact that 90% of everything he sees is COVID related. And they're seeing you know, the ICUs are full, the medicine wards are full, and the emergency rooms are full. People are waiting in the waiting room for days to be seen. They're being treated in the waiting room. Uh, maybe a sobering statistic that he said, uh, one of the nights I saw him when he had gotten off was he had pronounced seven people dead in the emergency room from COVID. And in addition, two non-COVID-related deaths that probably could have been uh, treated had they been caught earlier. Patients presented to the ED only to wait for hours and hours, with an, one with an MI and one with a, a ruptured triple A aortic abdominal aneurysm, both which uh, succumbed to their illness. So the, the other thing that was <clears throat> interesting to see was his, his mental state. Uh, you know, he, he works about 16 shifts a month, 12 hours at a time. And uh, previous to COVID, he would, you know, have periods of downtime and he would see sniffles and things like that, colds. Now it's uh, nonstop treating people that are dying or that he pronounces dead in the emergency room. And the mental uh, 
strain that 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 places on not only him but everybody else that works alongside him from a medic to a nurse to a, a nurse practitioner to another physician is really starting to wear on the entire system it, it is interesting to note though that uh, two things he mentioned to me that were were quite interesting he's only diagnosed two flu cases this entire season and he's had no RSV in children. So normally this time of year, he spends half his time, you know, giving kids nebulizer treatments and that sort of thing, diagnosing flu. And, and uh, there's only one kid admitted to the hospital, and that was an acute appendicitis case. Otherwise, there are no children in the hospital, which is uh, in stark contrast to every other year. But I think maybe to me, one of the recent news uh, bits of information that I found interesting is this variant, the, the COVID-19 variant that uh, was first recognized in Britain and now I believe in uh, it's spread to the U.S. It was also identified in Africa. And that is coming at a time where we're reaching new highs on daily diagnoses, new ICU admissions, uh, record death rates, only to now have uh, a variant that is significantly, uh, you know, uh, uh, associated with significantly higher rates of infectability and maybe a higher virulence. So uh, I think it's it's just a challenging time. Uh, you know, this is coming at the time where vaccinations are beginning to uh, to uh, uh, be given. I know uh, many of the providers have been vaccinated. I was able to get mine yesterday, uh, but it's not rolling out as quickly as we would like. I think I saw a quote that by the end of the year, they wanted to have 20 million vaccinations done and only 2.1 million were done. For, for various reasons, it's taking a bit longer to get the vaccinations out there. Uh, where I was able to get mine in San Antonio at, at the Methodist hospital system, uh, they had a tiered structure uh, where they gave the frontline ICU folks, the ER folks, uh, the vaccine first, and then they tiered it down to different levels of doctors and, and, and healthcare staff. Uh, it is not opened to the general public yet here in San Antonio or even those at greatest risk, the elderly or the immunocompromised. So I, I do think they're trying to be very careful in ensuring that they actually have enough second doses to give those that receive the first I heard talk today that maybe they're trying to uh, stretch that and, and not give the second dose to some, which I think would be a big mistake. Uh, but, uh, but there's lots to talk about relative to that. Maybe I'll stop there, Roger, and kick it back to you. That's an excellent and sober starting note uh, for this conversation. So I didn't realize that Stephen and I had so much in common uh, because uh, my younger sister is also an ER physician working in a community hospital in St. Louis, Christian um, Hospital. And I had the pleasure of seeing her over the holidays and the, the story is exactly the same as what Stevens reported. 90% uh, of the cases she sees are COVID related and she was here at my home going back into patient charts and um, uh, for patients she otherwise had to admit. And the number of deceased patients was overwhelmingly high and, and sobering. Um, and it was um, s startling to see the emotional, uh, uh, mental and physical wear on our frontline providers. And, and the same, um, you know, daunting concerns that uh, Stevens alluded to um, are pressing not beyond what we're seeing on the front line, but the implications to our patients with chronic liver disease. Uh, we have also rolled out uh, the vaccination programs here. I am due to get mine tomorrow, and I'm looking forward to that. But our patients with uh, NAFLD and NASH, chronic liver disease, those awaiting transplantations certainly uh, have not had the, uh, the access uh, yet in general population high risk uh, vaccination programs that we'd like to see. Um, and so that does pose a concern and especially with the new information about potentially 
a, even more contagious, while maybe not as virulent a strain of COVID-19, but the, the, the ability to keep pace with the transmission, if we are now dealing with uh, uh, more highly contagious strains of COVID, uh, does raise concern about existing infrastructure for rapid vaccination rollouts uh, and our ability to rapidly implement a herd immunity effect to protect our uh, high-risk uh, populations and patients at large. Uh, but the but the stories, the the emotions, the the concerns resonate uh, in exactly the same way as Stephen is depicted even uh, here in North Carolina and and what I'm seeing reported by uh, my my sibling who is also an ER physician. I can only echo what Manal and Stephen are saying because I'm no longer at the front line in the same way, but I know lots of colleagues who are, and it is it's a war zone. Um, people describe it as that. And I think, yes, the new variant um, was located here. I think they did some, by the sound of it, they, and I'm not a virologist before, and I'm holding my head up from what I know now. Um, so anybody correct me what I say. But um, my understanding was we had a, a region of England, southeast Kent particularly, and despite putting in lots of extreme measures into those regions, the rates didn't fall. So they did a deep dive by the look of it into some of the samples. And there was a sample collected in September, which when they got round to it in October, showed this variant um, strain. So I think they called it VUI 2020-12-1 because it was a series of mutations of genetic coding. Now, there were appears to be two particular mutations on that. Um, one is the N501Y, which sits on the spike protein, um, which appears to have changed the way the virus interacts with our cells, is my understanding, and therefore making it, um, it attaches to certain proteins of our own cells and makes it more infectious. Um, and there's also mutation 6970-DEL, um, which um, we've it's lost two amino acids on the spike protein, so it evades the immune response in some patients who are particularly immunocompromised, seems to be the group at risk. But they haven't identified um, currently on the data that it's any more, it causes any more severe infection or uh, mortality. It became dominant as a variant somewhere in November and December, but but it was only the, eight, uh, the 18th of December that our nerve tag, which is the New and Emerging Virus Threats Advisory Group, advised the government. So that's only, uh, I think, 15 days ago, which then led to us locking down Christmas. We were due a five day window, um, which was reduced to one day. And actually, my parents cancelled well in advance as soon as all of this started because they're both shielding. I think a lot of people made the right decisions. Um, there was a lot less mixing of older households, um, and that went through the period. Um, and Imperial College, their data suggests that this is 70% more transmissible um, on their evidence than the um, normal strain um, that we'll get. So, but it is the same control measures, um, and we call it hands, face, and space. So it's obviously washing your hands, um, covering your face, and keeping space, but also reducing as much social contact as we can. So a lot of people are trying to do that. Um, but currently, 144 of our lower tiers, which I presume means our tiers with less restrictions, have identified at least one person um, of with that variant. So it's now rapidly going throughout the country, although it remains a real concern in the south and southeast of England. We've now gone into a lockdown in Scotland. The Prime Minister, as we've been starting, has now announced a national lockdown in the UK, which is as severe by the look of it as it was in the initial lockdown and not a little bit more relaxed as it was in the second lockdown. The strategy has changed to giving the vaccinations to the highest risk individuals, but actually extending that vaccine out to up to 12 weeks for the second dose to get as many people covered as quickly as possible. 
um, with the vaccines that we've got available appears. So we've now started um, Oxford universities and AstraZeneca first doses were given today. So that's 62 to 90% effective. And from the evidence that I was looking at after day 10 in the trials, there seemed to be a, a real significant drop in the amount of people presenting with COVID infections, which is one of the reasons they're extending it out. That appears to be the easiest one to give. It's fridge temperature. Um, and we've got a lot of vaccines um, available of that. And we've got the Pfizer BioNTech um, one, which people are now receiving their second doses, which may well go from four weeks to 12 weeks as a second dose, I think. But there is no current plan, as far as I can tell, despite rumours that you will be given by Pfizer, BioNTech first, and then followed up by AstraZeneca um, and Oxford University. It's still a one set of vaccines that you'll be given first and second. But it will extend in most people from 12, 21 days to 12 weeks. Uh, and in fact, my parents have been given their two dates and they're 12 weeks apart. Um, so we're going by the look of it to maximise the amount of people that we can get with a, a resistance um, of around about 62 to 70 percent within 10 to 20 days of having that vaccine, which I suppose a lot of people um are backing and agreeing with from the medical world because we need to stop the spread of this variant quicker. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, but the UK, and I think like anybody's health resources, are responding astronomically because we've already got 730 vaccine centres, vaccination sites already established, and we look to get over a 1,000 by the end of the week. And yet that's in all of the restricted resources that we've got with people at the front line, the ITU beds and the overwhelming of the NHS. And in fact, the reason we've gone into a lockdown, sadly, is that in some areas we predict the NHS to be overwhelmed in 21 days time. So that is shocking, something I would never have expected to see or hear in my professional career of a, a massive health system despite the bed losses and reduction in beds over the last 10 to 15 years, I still wouldn't have said that we are going to overwhelm the National Health Service in around about 21 days if we don't absolutely get on top of this. Now, and all we can do is say, will people learn around the world to try and close this down as quickly as possible with the vaccination? And the WHO approved... Um, the, the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine today for emergency use is my understanding. So we're in dark times, but light is at the end of the tunnel if we can get this vaccination program out quick enough. But do we have the resources to get it done quick enough? And is there a risk of mutation beyond and, and resistance to the vaccine? And I suppose those are questions we won't know. No, I don't think we do. First of all, let's talk about the totality of what you just said, right? We're now nine or 10 months into this thing in most of the Western world. And fundamentally, we've not made progress, right? Britain is shutting down completely again. U.S. is seeing two to 250,000 new cases a day, which is a frightening number, and starting to overwhelm health systems at which, rate, at which point mortality rates go up. Um, health workers are exhausted. And... Um, for different reasons on both sides of the pond, there's skepticism about the kind of lockdown that is necessary to make this work. So the hope has been the vaccine would be the solution. Right. Uh, last month in Health Affairs magazine, um, a group of folks um, published an article, one of the authors being Dr. Rochelle Walensky of Mass General, who is now uh, to become Biden's Center of Disease Control Director. The paper talked about the relative value of having a highly effective vaccine and a highly effective social management program. Um, David Leonard wrote this up in an article in the New York Times. I'll just quote a, some of the numbers in his article. He said, basically, he asked the health affairs authors to put their findings into a way non-scientists could understand. And this is what you get. If we assume the vaccine is 95% effective, 
and we are running new infections at the rate that we are right now. In the next six months, we will see 10 million more Americans getting that virus. That's against about 20 million so far. So 50% more people will get the virus, and we'll see more than 160,000 additional deaths. Those numbers are brutal. Here's the converse. If the vaccine was only 50% effective, but we could get the case rate back to where it was in September, which was 35,000 cases a day, not the seven times that it is now, that would keep the death rate to about 60,000 people. So if we were willing to go into severe lockdown and the vaccine didn't work that well, we'd be 100,000 lives in the U.S. and several million cases ahead of where we will be with a 95% effective vaccine and uh, inadequate social um, controls. That specifically is the rationale behind giving one dose instead of two, which is for the individual who gets the vaccine, getting two is a lot more protection. But with, with this new variant, 62% looks pretty good if you can get twice as many uh, doses out there and you can get people to be more socially responsible because they feel more hopeful. So it's a real dilemma. And I expect... Some of the things that we'll see for fatty liver patients, right, is they'll have a harder time getting seen. Um, clinical trials will probably fall off further than we might have anticipated otherwise, although I'm going to leave it for Stephen Rennell to talk about what that means. And um, the more demoralized healthcare workers become and the less willing um, societies at large become to live with these strictures, the problem only gets worse. So I think that's where we are, folks. I was just thinking when you were talking and listening to what's going on around the world, and we've repeatedly discussed, and there's a lot of evidence come out at Digital European Liver Conference and the Digital American Conference, that we know that fatty liver is playing a role in um, driving a lot of severity and mortality. If you look at the UK uh, biobank, 10% liver fat with obesity in those that were obese, um, although that was only 50% of that population, it tripled their risk. Now, we had an obesity strategy and drive following Boris Johnson's illness to get people to lose weight without really measuring it and with the only just telling people to lose weight, get eat less, move more, uh, the same old, same old, which a lot of people don't respond to. Whereas I wonder if what we could be seeing, and this is me speculating here, is that we know that 16.4 million people in the UK and nearly 100 million Americans have fatty liver disease. And the quicker this variant spreads through the population, is there a risk that because we have not diagnosed those patients, that they are the ones that could be ending up in hospital at a quicker rate because we're just spreading this virus now very, very rapidly. Um, but we've not prepared them. We've just simply told people to lose weight. We haven't told them to, it's their liver fat that we're trying to reduce. We haven't been able to identify those characters, but with 16.4 million people at risk, and both Oswald and Easel said that patients with fatty liver disease and NASH were at risk. Um, those are massive numbers of pa patients and people who could be fueling this influx into hospital. And what you would expect to see is younger, with less comorbid diagnosed conditions, presenting to hospital. You know, that's the paradox, Louise, is these are the at-risk patients but we have potential uh, significant treatment opportunities for those patients to help them with their liver disease if they could make it in to our clinical trials. You know, gone are the days of just kind of testing the waters in fatty liver. No, the drugs we have now are very, very good at defatting the liver. Many of them are. And and I think that that has borne out in some of the trials that were presented in 2020 
and those trials have moved on to later stage trials uh, in 2021. <clears throat> and we know that that by defatting the liver, we've we've seen positive impacts on inflammation and fibrosis as well. The issue is um, twofold. Number one, just today we had a, a cirrhotic patient cancel their screening visit because they were concerned about being exposed to COVID and coming into, you know, getting in the car, driving here, opening the door, coming and sitting in a waiting room, even though everything is set up as you say, what it hands, face, and distance. So we do that in our clinic, but still patients are appropriately concerned. And, and on top of that, then my staff are also affected. Uh, I don't know how many of our staff are currently out with COVID or their spouse has COVID or their kids have COVID, whole households. Uh, three out of four of my family had COVID. Uh, and, and so, you know, I was out for 14 days socially distancing. And when you have enough of your PIs and sub eyes and clinical research coordinators and phlebotomists out, you can't effectively run a clinical research division. And then you have patients on top of that that are scared. So that's the paradox. We have potential life saving treatment, so to speak. And I use that because we're. Their trials aren't designed at these early phase studies to show life-saving intervention, but but we have shown that we can effectively defat livers, and we know that 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 may may be impactful if they were to get infected with COVID. So that's part of our dilemma, uh, Roger. To your point, uh, there's no doubt uh, all of our studies are shifted to the right. Clinical trial enrollment. Uh, is proceeding despite the daily new record numbers of COVID, but it is a challenge and it's probably, you know, a third to almost a half of our patients less than we would normally be seeing uh, as a result of this pandemic. So, uh, you know, enrollment, as long as we see high rates of COVID, NASH clinical trials, I would suspect all clinical trials are going to be uh, significantly slowed in, in their enrollment. I don't know, Manal, do you agree yeah, with that? I, I, I do agree with that. And, and you know, we can look at this whole phenomena, which is really um, uh, beyond belief, uh, as the glass half empty or the potentially glass half full, with a lot of challenge and adversity comes opportunity for innovation and discovery. And while we have seen a blunting of um, uh, uh, progress in, in clinical trials recruitment, and even on the clinical care front, delays in access to care or patients presenting with, with uh, a more advanced uh, hepatocellular carcinoma because they missed a visit or didn't get access to clinical care during the time of COVID. So what otherwise would have been manageable had we been in the normal uh, uh, way of doing and providing uh, medical care to our patients is now presenting at later stages or with more uh, uh, advanced disease or complications. With that has also come a different way of doing business in the context of clinical care and clinical research. Uh, we've we've resorted to telemedicine and, and video visits. So we've, we've found different ways of, of delivering care beyond patient visits and potentially even delivering clinical care in the context because it was a um, shame to not allow, as we've talked about with vaccination strategies, new therapies in the context of, of novel targets and novel drugs being uh, rendered accessible to patients in need. And so in the same way that we talk about new frameworks of providing access to vaccinations, we need to start thinking about different frameworks by which to render uh, timely, appropriate uh, interventions for our patients with chronic heart disease and move away from the concept that it's going to eventually go back to business as usual. Because in my opinion, I, I don't think it will ever go back to business as usual and providing medical care and providing access to medical research differently. Um, but 
when you take a look at the field overall, it is is it is really um, encouraging and exciting what has uh, uh, unfolded in new developments with drug therapeutics and biomarkers despite the era of COVID. We saw multiple innovative uh, studies and outcomes presented both at the ASL meeting and the ESL meeting that should inspire us that we can do more and we should be doing more and the resiliency of the human spirit does potentially overcome because we have moved progress forward despite uh, significant hurdles in making advancements in the field of apple and ash. Okay, I'm going to take some numbers I think I remember from previous episodes and see how this goes together. Stephen, I think you, have, you estimated at one point last fall that there was going to be a need for 11,000 um, clinical trial-related biopsies, say, in a, over the next year. Do I have that right? Well, let, yeah, just to clarify, we if to enroll what's in clintrials.gov, mm -hmm. phase two and phase three, we need about 11,000 NASH biopsy proven NASH patients. Right. So to, to get to there, we've actually got to screen about 24 to 25,000 fatty liver cases. And how many patients are there in the U.S. who have clinical NASH at a level where they would be responsive to the drug in question? Oh, well, many more than that. I mean, there's yeah. you know, probably 25 million with with Nash, uh, and we we would expect that uh, many of those would respond. It's it's a matter of disease awareness. Again, paradoxically, I think COVID has brought that to light, at least in the UK and uh, and, and other places where we're we're seeing fatty liver come up in the same conversation with COVID. But but make no mistake, it, it it's a huge. Uh, it's a huge disease awareness issue. I, I, I agree with that. And as Louise points out in his, today, and as we've all discussed several times on this podcast, exercise more, eat less is not um, a viable long-term strategy for most people, particularly if they're not seeing their doctors. We said, we said last year was a problem, which you see them once every three months. Now, it probably is more than once every three months, and people are more depressed, and they're spending more time in their homes, which was likely to push them towards worse habits. I was reading alcohol sales in the U.S. were at 54% over 2019 and 2020, and my only surprise was that the number wasn't higher than that. Um, so it seems to me that there's a huge challenge around mobilization, and part of that challenge is education, but part of that challenge is hope. And... The problem is that the vaccine is, in theory, the beacon for hope. But that's rolling out here very slowly, as you pointed out. I mean, um, somebody I read said that at the rate we're going right now, we could vaccinate the entire U.S. population in 10 years. So there will be a new normal. How does that new normal start to mobilize hope or, the, or belief better in an era when the drugs are coming, but they're not here yet. You continue to beat the drum of, of good news. You, be, you continue to put out, you know, continue to put out positive data. And, and I think those good news stories get told and retold and retold. You know, maybe it starts in a clinical presentation. Maybe it starts in a press release. Then it, uh, then it makes its way to a publication. Then it makes its way into a CME lecture, or it makes it your, its way into a throwaway journal, or it makes its way to a patient advocacy group like GLI or uh, the Fatty Liver Foundation or others. And it begins to socialize through social media and other web-based channels. That heartbeat of positive data doesn't have to slow down because of COVID. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to really drive that. And part of the reason we started this podcast, Roger, was to do just that. Yep. I agree fully that education is going to be key. And we should not um, uh, uh, dampen or, or, um, or, or 
delay the the dissemination of innovative scientific information. But I've also found that, interestingly, those patients who are motivated and those centers that have the capabilities can execute clinical studies and access to new therapies in very new and innovative ways. Um, for clinical care, I've had uh, uh, nutritionists and exercise physiologists get on Zoom meetings and exercise virtually with a patient at home or, or render nutritional innovation. We have used um, um, web-based media to, uh, to render education through, you know, for example, the, the International NASH Day on a virtual platform, which could be more broadly accessible to patient advocacy and patient or, uh, groups that are within our own practice. Uh, we sent out the link to all the patients with NASH in my program so that they can access information even though they didn't have access to a provider to get such information. And interestingly, um, and I've had the same experience as Stephen has, despite staff being sick or patients being um, resident to come to the clinical study center, we've started doing uh, consenting via Zoom-based works, uh, sharing of, of uh, important events, rendering um, knowledge about uh, drugs and drug trials to patients on a virtual platform, and effectively implementing screening strategies that are predominantly virtual with what we have defined as a lab and leave visit. One of my coordinators one time was was had a patient who was reluctant to the site for drug drug stuff. So she was innovative enough to do the uh, drive-by drug pickup where the patient came by, popped open the trunk, cheap event medication in a patient's trunk, popped it closed, and then as soon as they got home, proceeded to do the virtual counseling session uh, about drug administration and, and, and drug accountability. So it doesn't have to be business as usual. It just has to be business done differently. And it doesn't mean to say that it would be any less effective or any less impactful and yet allow us to render access uh, across different platforms. Now, that really does get on the buy-in of multiple different entities that have to come together, but CROs and sites and investigators and even federal regulatory in, in, um, agencies to how we can be innovative in drug development pipelines and drug development um, programs to allow for a new normal, such that we can not stagnate bringing uh, promising drugs to FDA review and potentially to market because of a new normal. So I loved the lab and leave, and I loved the minimal visit interaction that can be rendered. And all patient quality of life questionnaires such that they put on a home portal as opposed to having to come into my clinic and use an in-clinic tablet or fill out an in-clinic paper uh, form. We have to be more uh, out-of-the-box thinkers here. And one of the things I love about that is that, for example, what you said about the nutritionist and the exercise physiologist, that doesn't have to be limited to people in clinical trials. Right. So now if it's better, work out more, eat less. Now we will actually give you professionals who will work with you on a personal basis remotely. You know, and that doesn't have to be limited to folks in trials. It certainly doesn't have to be limited to folks in trials. And and as opposed to having the framework where care is center centric, mm -hmm. where you have to come to a center, I think we need to shift our mindset to. Uh, that care is going to be in pockets of, of outreach to our patients such that they can receive the necessary education, the necessary care, the necessary interventions for clinical trial participation more in their home-based level as opposed to a center-based structure um, and allow that to still happen within the constructs of regulatory compliance. Menal raises lots of excellent points there because what we do know, there's a lot of evidence that people who want to do weight loss programs do better if they're in a communal environment or a shared experience. Now, that can be online because at least they know there are other people there than they do as a single person trying to motivate themselves. They're more likely to keep weight off. 
So we know that that sort of method works. It may also be one of the reasons that placebo do so well in clinical studies because they're one of they're part of a group, rather than that whole individualized perspective that you don't get too much. You're left to do it on your own, and just even knowing that there's somebody else there like you is a real positive motivator for uh, for change, even in a placebo arm. And I think I've seen it in multiple trials that they befriend each other. They sit in the waiting rooms together, they share phone numbers, they share experiences, so they motivate themselves. And I think it may be one of the confounders for the placebo responses that we see in fatty liver studies or any study that requires weight loss. But I think for going on in, in future care, Manal's perfectly correct, we won't go back to the new normal. So much more diagnostics, non-invasive, will now be done in the community setting so that you get, as a physician, a better level of quality of patient referral so you can make decisions online without seeing the patient or the decision to see the patient. I think we will move in liver disease and in lots of other disease fields in that way. And I think we've discussed it with Donna before and Stephen, things like Noon, a lot of these wellness sites and websites that people can get into for motivation, for um, reassurance, for counselling, they will come into their own if we can get the message across. Um, and I think, so Manal's perfectly correct. We will create a newer, improved normal for lots of people. And the old normal will be better for other portfolios of patients. So let me take the last few comments and try to tie them together. Hope is coming because the drugs are because better drugs are, are arriving. We're developing modes of treating people remotely, which are currently being adapted for clinical trials because that's where the urgency is greatest, but can certainly be uh, administered or used for patients who aren't in clinical trials, but just are trying to use whatever conventional methods exist. Particularly if we can do that with a sense of community, which can be virtual community or real community. So, how do we? Um, motivate hepatologists and gastroenterologists who aren't spending their time in the clinical trials, that this is a worthy thing for their practice to engage? And how do we educate patients that there's now one more reason to defat your liver without scaring the stuffing out of them, or scaring the stuffing out of them to a point where it, demo where it immobilizes them as compared to mobilizes them? I suppose if I was a physician, uh, a hepatologist, and obviously having worked in multiple hepatology departments and listening to the BSG and things like that, we're now looking at more remote um, interfacing with patients, but getting better referrals through. Ian Rowe was um, very eloquent on talking about getting the right patients through his programme with FibroScan and non-invasive uh, markers in the community to get the better patients to the secondary specialist care area that are just going to be swamped. FibroScan lists have gone down again. They're over a year in um, waiting lists in some of these hospitals already. There's going to be a two-year wait for FibroScan. These staff uh, here in the UK have been redeployed to different areas. They may even be re redeployed now to vaccination programmes. Um, Vlad was very confident that this wouldn't affect the trials in 2021, 2022. I would suggest we may see that that lag, as Stephen was suggesting earlier, the amount of patients that are going to need to be screened to get onto trials. They can't get through the door. So I think we'll be seeing this for a, a long time. And I think if I was an endocrinologist, cardiologist, I'd again want to be assessing those patients personally. Better, so I'm seeing the right patient at the right time. Um, and we've got, we, Manal's been right, and so Stephen, we've got better ways to do it now that we're learning as uh, from the opportunities that COVID sadly is presenting with us in a speedier way. We may not have been here for another 10 years, uh, but we're here now. Yeah. And there's no doubt, I think we need to think about doing things differently. Hospital-based physicians and providers are currently overwhelmed with the burden of COVID and COVID-related uh, complications. And those patients who uh, are accessible to us don't have access into our 
centralized health systems because of density control, because of concerns about being in a COVID, uh, high COVID prevalent area and are reluctant to come in. Maybe we need to think about different frameworks of visiting coordinators where you are actually coming in with a portable fiber scan or a portable ability to draw blood and doing home-based screening and home-based testing when access either because of of the health system or because of of our patients is is limited. Uh, We saw this happen with with different um, uh, disease basis outside of liver disease, you know, oncology, uh, hospice care, uh, visiting nurses when when access was limited uh, for health center resource utilization reasons or inability for patient to gain access. And I, I think we need to create different constructs by which to be uh, able to reach our patients with chronic liver disease. Um, those in trials and those outside of trials um, find different ways of managing a decompensated cirrhotic in, 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 in alternative strategies besides in the hospital and do so successfully um, using frameworks that work and allow us to render access to ther- therapeutic drugs, uh, those that are used as standard of care, and those that are used in the context of clinical research. As I said, with 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 adversity comes innovation and discovery. So I think we're going to get there, and you see these wheels turning already. I'm hopeful that by uh, the middle to even end of 2021, we're going to see implementation of new strategies. Manal, you said it. I think very eloquently at the top of the podcast that challenges create opportunities, um, obstacles create opportunities, and we'll get past this and we'll be creative in the way that we do it. And on the back end, we'll we'll have a much better story to tell. It's just we're in the middle of it right now. And how do we, you know, how do we make lemonade out of lemons? How do we? How do we find a treatment for another pandemic in the setting of a current pandemic? And, you know, it's again, it's through it's through trial and error. It's through discussions like this, uh, working together, you know, in a consensus fashion. I, I, you know, it's interesting to me. We've had more dialogue with patient advocacy groups in the past six months than I've had in the past 10 years, whether it's GLI or Fatty Liver Foundation or whoever, there really is a move to synergize what we're doing to reach the patients at the greatest need. We're well on our way to doing that. It's not going to be without ongoing challenges. You know, people thought that just get to the first quarter of 2021 and it'll all be better. Well, it it will get better, but it, you know, uh, there are hiccups along the way, even with, even with our best treatments, uh, there are hiccups. So we're moving in the right direction, I would say, and we just need to keep, keep our nose to the grindstone, Roger, and and keep trying to deliver the message uh, like we're doing today and and in as many other formats as we can. Right. Yes. As we do every weekend, I think that's right about the other formats. Um, so it seems to me that clinical trials, we know what to do. We just have to keep on keeping on and become a little more creative about how to do it. I think that's what I'm hearing. Okay. Uh, mass population, much tougher, right? But um, it feels to me that the two linchpins there are finding a way to educate about the COVID liver length, the patients, and the doctors, by the way, to, to motivate the people who treat patients but aren't actively involved in clinical trials, whether, in fact, as Louise says, they are endocrinologists and cardiologists who may be involved in other clinical trials but not our clinical trials, but see our patients and understand the impact of metabolic syndromes, or whether they're hepatologists and gastros and even internists who have a significant portion of their practice just in, in line patient treatment. In that vein, we're, we're, we're still trying to work through some challenges. And, and a good example of that is 
what I try to do here in San Antonio and in Austin and in South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley is get out into primary care and endocrine and other GI offices and discuss fatty liver, discuss clinical trials, discuss, discuss options for our patients. Well, pre-COVID, that was very easy for me to set up a lunch and learn, you know, an early morning breakfast, coffee, something, get into the office, sit down at their desk and have a frank discussion, hand out some literature and make myself available if they have any follow on questions. Now, I can't get into the office. And we try to set up Zoom calls and literally 90% of the time, the physician is pulled away to deal with some COVID related issue. And it so, so in the provider's mindset, fatty liver is taken a back seat because in their eyes, it's not what's killing the patient today. I can't argue with that mindset. No, no. If the urgent becomes the enemy, the important, the urgent's going to win every time. Right. So how, I think, you know, just as we've been creative at delivering health care to our patients and continuing clinical trials, as Manal outlined with her coordinators that are outside the box thinkers and get creative with delivering drug and doing Zoom follow-up calls. How do we do that with physicians? How do we, how do we find a newer way to deliver the information that we need to deliver in a way that we know is effective? It's, it, it's a challenge to do that particularly with our primary care colleagues. It's, it's one thing for Manal and I to get on a, a Zoom call. We do that all the time. Uh, I, I've seen Manal more this year uh, virtually than I have ever seen her in person. I've learned more about her house than I have. I've never been to her house, but I, I, I see it right now. Uh, <laughs> and I use that as an illustration to say, how do we, how do we, take that message and and push it out to the level where in in the military terminology boots on ground we get it to the people that can affect the change not at a not at a, a very hierarchical level of a of a hepatologist who spends his life in nash but but down at the primary care level that's seeing you know, a diabetic, obese, hypertensive, hyperlipidemic patient scheduling the, you know, the colonoscopy, the mammogram, dealing with the HEDIS measures, dealing the dealing with the HbA1c, the lipid management, the ASCVD risk score, and oh by the way, there's a fatty liver. But you know, Steve, I love your analogy, the boots on the ground and 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 the army scenario because. It's going to take a village, and this is not all about the onus of responsibility on sites or investigators or coordinators. We really need for everybody in industry or with CROs out there who are listening, we need constructs and we need to have new allowances in protocols that were never really designed for virtual care settings. Uh, we need um, uh, potential Every time we have a COVID case now in the context of clinical trial, it will elevate liver aminotransferases and it can't be deemed a, a dilly signal without a mechanism for elucidating whether it's COVID or, or not study drug. We really have to start framing some of our protocols, some of our allowances for how we execute clinical trials, for how we report adverse events. How, for how we um, uh, deal with COVID-related uh, protocol deviations or windows, um, how we capture and actually define even primary endpoints. We can't bring the volume of biopsy that we used to. There's enough debate in the field that whether that endpoint could stand alone in and of itself as a primary outcome. We need regulatory CROs, sponsors, and, and investigators and sites to reframe how we do clinical research in a new era. Um, otherwise, we're going to have stumbling stones. I think, Manel, I think that's great. And we're coming to the end of our time. So what I was going to ask everybody to do, and you may have done that, you tell me, is to 
take a couple of minutes and talk about a solution that either is implementable or we need to figure out how to make implementable to push the big issue forward. And I think what you just did was a fantastically eloquent description of one of those. If you got another one, go for it. And uh, while you're thinking about that, Stephen or Louise? I think I, I'd follow on slightly from what um, Manal said there and uh, look at the major f sort of farmer industries who are looking at Nash, Naffold and liver studies, that it's not all focused at the recruiting site. Is that it is about going to educate GPs because we are now going to have to scan and screen in primary care because these patients do not want to come to secondary care. They don't want to go to big centres. So if we can actually diversify our education strategy um, at a clinical trial point to target GPs for education, for recruitment, for involvement in these studies, we're more likely to get awareness on all levels and from patients because at the moment it seems to be targeted once they get to secondary care in the UK or once they get to a study site. Now, they're not that common in liver disease, as we know, um, and people feeding into that. So, again, reinventing the wheel, finding these patients for biopsy, for ideal trial criteria. We've got the FAR score now. We've got NIS4. We've got uh, ELF. We've got lots of tools that we can utilise in a primary care setting, in regions, to really recruit to these studies, but in a unique way. So I suppose that, that for me is following on from when, what Manal said. Yeah. To put it in perspective, uh, what our coordinators see and what our patients experience, I'll, I'll give you a little scenario that kind of puts a brush stroke on, on what I, I uh, alluded to. Uh, at our site, we are density controlled. Not all coordinators can be on site and all doors are actually in lockdown with the exception of one main entrance for which all entrances have to be screened for COVID. Simple scenario that occurred in the context of a clinical study. A shipment of a refrigerated drug comes to site with no ability for the courier to bring it to the site. So the study drug gets diverted to the holding station for which somebody then has to go pick it up, but isn't necessarily refrigerated because the person who receives it doesn't know that, that it's study drug. And we pick it up a day later and fortunately was still temperature control. However, a minor scenario like that raises concern that we've received study drug, it got, transverted, it maybe got delayed in shipment, uh, got received by the wrong individual, nobody was informed, and and the patients couldn't potentially get it in the time frame that they needed to get it within window because there is a delay in getting their access to site. And immediately my head turned is, why could not in an IVRS system, that drug not been released directly to a patient and the shipment been directly sent to a home and reconciled. I mean, there are unique nuances that nobody ever really thinks about until you're in the moment and you experience it. And you said, we have managed this differently, but under the current way of, of, of how things are operating, there would have been no way to anticipate it or change the construct of how we even manage drug dispensing. Um, and that's just paints, uh, to, to sponsors and CROs, really what's happening at the ground level and how we can reframe how we do uh, implementation of the study. It's interesting. I heard re-engineering more than I heard reframing, but I guess it's both. I mean, it's literally re-engineering the path, cutting out all the inefficient steps and making sure things get where they've got to get to as quickly as possible with this few handoffs. I, I think re-engineering is a better word. Just on one comment on that, and that's absolutely vital because if one step of this covid roll out of vaccinations struggles, then the whole thing will come down, whether or not it's lack of glass to put the vial to create the multi-dose vials, multiple injections. My fear is we might see in the third world what happened with Egypt. We, we get mass vaccination with limited needles and syringes and we come back round with a a viral illness of a hepatitis C type scenario in the future with the way this could be rolled out for speed, but I'm hoping that won't happen. I'm going to end with this provocative thought, something for you to think about before our next podcast. Imagine a scenario 
where the UK has a thousand vaccina vaccination sites around the country. That being replicated at thousands of sites in the US and around the world. And at the same time, we have portable fiber scans there at the vaccination site, filling out a questionnaire, which they already do anyway, describing their comorbidities. If they hit on a couple of those buzzwords like diabetes, like obesity, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, get your vaccination. If you're interested, get your fiber scan. We have these cool chemical analyzers called piccolos. We use them in the military. You can actually do a finger stick and get an ALT and AST and an HbA1c in less than 15 minutes. Get your fiber scan, get your liver enzymes checked at the time you get your vaccination. And if it's positive, we have people there at the site to teach you what that means and refer you to follow on care. Imagine what that would do to disease state awareness. I love, I love it. I, I love that. I love that. And we've been uh, preaching that for for months on this podcast. <laughs> but 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 I love the idea. The way you make the urgent, not the enemy, the important is when people do what's urgent, you make them also learn what's important, which is what Stephen just described. I think that's great. I, if we're going to dare to dream, let me do one more. Um, at what point does it become appropriate to ask if compassionate use protocols for the best defatting drugs in trial make sense for people where we believe that their liver fat levels and other comorbidities make them a particularly high risk not to survive a COVID infection. I think we, we that's a very strong consideration for those patients, particularly who advance, have advanced hepatic fibrosis. Yep. Uh, we, we cannot leave the highest risk cohort, our patients with obesity, diabetes, and cirrhosis uh, without uh, compassionate access and, and easy access to, to therapeutics that can particularly improve their um, clinical outcomes or decrease uh, their risk for fibrosis. I was going to say that now, if you're free next week, I'd love to make this a two-parter. Spend next week, basically all being John Lennon, imagine whatever you want to imagine, and say, okay, what are the, what, what are the things that are too bold for anyone to really think about but if we dare to dream it, maybe we could make it happen. Uh, you know, I, I would love to join you next week because I think these discussions are a highly pertinent, very important, clinically relevant, and 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 we have to have these difficult discussions in order to make forward progress. It's essential for those of us that care for disease. We have to be innovative and and push um, the, this ball forward despite the challenges. I love that idea, and um, of of bringing uh, awareness, education, the 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 prompt reportable uh, uh, endpoints like a portable fiber scan or uh, uh, you know prompt turnaround for ALT and AST and, and glycemic control to the patient as opposed to the anticipation that they're going to be brought to us. Uh, it's just not going to happen uh, in this new era. And uh, I would love to join you next week. Um, and if and you're about, if you're available, you're invited. And I'm going to try to see if I can um, motivate either Donna uh, Cryer or Jeff McIntyre, who's the head of Nash programs at GLI, to join us as well and take a whole different spin on this. I want to thank you guys. This has been a great discussion. I think a wonderful way to kick off the year. Um, not a happy topic, but a topic where if you spend time banging on it, you can start to see what you can dream to do. Uh, so, Manal, thank you, Louise, Steve, and all of you. Uh, thanks to Mike Wilson, who will eventually be engineering this thing. He's a little under the weather right now. I'll get to it in a day or two, and we're going to put it out before he can get to it, because I want this ep episode out. Eric Rounds, Palatea, and all of you folks who listen, um, we will be putting this episode out on January 7th, and then we will see if we can cut it into some sub-pieces and put those out maybe over the weekend so folks don't have to listen to all 60-whatever minutes of it as it was. To everybody, have a great week. Stay healthy. Be extra vigilant about staying healthy because things are sneaking up on us faster than we could have imagined. And surf on. We'll see you next week on the podcast. Bye-bye now. 
Drug developers, investors, researchers, and corporate executives wrestle weekly to understand what is happening in commercial development of NASH medications. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, and forecasting and pricing guru Roger Green as they discuss the issues affecting the evolving NASH market from their own unique perspectives on the Surfing the NASH Tsunami podcast.